Okay, thank you and welcome back in our new, in our new venue. Um, we will be hearing from a few panels now. Uh, we'll be starting with the Board of Corrections. Again, apologies to all and thank you to the Board for wading through uh, a long round of testimony with the Department. Um, we're, we're still here with the two chairs, Chair Rory Lansman and Chair Helen Rosenthal. Um, we're going to swear you in at the beginning and, and then we will take your testimony. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask everyone on the panel to raise your right hand, and we'll swear you all in together. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. I do. Great. Thank you. You can get started. Start. You can get started. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Lansman, Powers, and Rosenthal, and members of the committees on criminal justice, women, and the justice system. My name is Martha King, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction, the independent oversight agency for the city's correctional facilities. The board promulgates minimum standards which regulate jail conditions, monitors compliance with these standards, and provides general oversight for the Department of Correction and Health and Hospitals Correctional Health Services. Today, I am joined by a board member who was appointed by the City Council, Dr. Robert Cohen, and the board's Deputy Executive Director of Research, Emily Turner. In November 2016, the board passed 42 minimum standards that are designed to detect, prevent, and respond to sexual abuse and harassment of people who are incarcerated in the New York City jails. The board standards build from the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act regulations and have additional requirements, like the 90-day requirement regarding investigations, the provision of rape crisis counseling and advocacy services to victims, and the release of biannual assessments and corrective actions. These standards are groundbreaking because they secure local oversight and enforcement, including board monitoring and a private right of action for individuals in custody to pursue if the department or correctional health fails to comply with their obligations. Since September 2017, board staff have reported every six months at the board's public meetings on the progress and challenges in DOC's and correctional health's implementation of these standards. DOC has made progress in a few areas creating new policies which reflect the board's requirements, training staff, creating ways for people to report abuse, and providing education on zero tolerance and reporting. The board's primary concerns have been the high number of allegations of sexual abuse and harassment and DOC's investigations into these allegations. These investigations take too long to complete and often lack all required components. It is therefore not surprising that substantiation rates of these complaints are lower than national averages and that we still have a great deal of work to do to build the accountability necessary to prevent abuse in, the New in New York City's jails. Rates of sexual victimization in New York City jails have been higher than national averages since at least 2011. The Bureau of Justice Statistics identified a nationwide rate of 8.03 allegations per 1,000 people incarcerated in jails in 2015. This is lower than the New York City jail rates of 12.6 in the last half of, of 2017 and 9.91 for the first half of 2018. Today, I will provide updates in three areas of the standards where the board has focused, investigations, screening of people in custody for risk, and housing and safety of transgender people in custody. Since the new standards on sexual abuse, there's little evidence that the investigations process has improved or become more effective. Timely and comprehensive investigations are central to compliance with board standards. Without inf effective investigations, DOC's efforts at prevention, accountability, and discipline will also be unsuccessful. Investigations into sexual abuse and harassment allegations are not being completed within 90 days as required. Approximately 94% of 2016 and 2017 investigations are still open and pending. Substantiation rates in New York City are also lower than national averages. This, unfortunately, is a long-standing trend. In 2016, the board found that the department's investigations were significantly deficient in terms of timeliness, thoroughness, and objectivity. Following a discussion of violations of the board's investigation standards at its April 2018 public meeting, DOC developed and presented a corrective action plan at the June public meeting. The plan aims to close the backlog of cases older than 90 days by February 2019 and to increase staffing and reduce caseloads. The board is monitoring and hopeful about potential progress under this plan. 
The board will also release an audit of 42 DOC investigation files on September 14th and will conduct such an audit annually to assess the adequacy of these investigations. At the foundation of DOC's ability to protect people in their custody from sexual abuse is their ability to accurately assess people for risk of victimization and to use this information to inform housing. The board's standards and PREA require that the department's intake screening process assess people in custody for their risk of being sexually abused or sexually abusive toward others. The screening must consider many things, such as disability status, criminal history, whether the person is or is perceived as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or gender nonconforming, previous experience of sexual victimization, and a person's own perception of vulnerability. The board's September 2017 report noted deficiencies with the department's method for screening for risk and found that DOC was not meeting these standards because of obstacles to tracking and using information gleaned from a paper-based intake screening. Therefore, the board unanimously passed a resolution in October 2017 requiring corrective action to quickly implement an electronic method of screening. As a result, in January 2018, DOC implemented an electronic screening process. This electronic screening allows DOC to track people at risk of sexual victimization, to reassess everyone at 30 days, and to use this information to inform housing, work, education, and program assignments. This is important progress that should increase safety, and we continue to monitor the impact. The board has also focused its work on increasing the safe housing options for transgender people in custody. National data and the board's own data show transgender people in custody are at higher risk of victimization in jail. When the department announced it would close the transgender housing unit, the board was vocal in its opposition. The board believes the unit to be an important option for people who voluntarily apply to be housed there. We also published a study of the transgender housing unit in February 2018. The report led to an improved management and application system for the unit and in turn an uptick in the number of people placed there. The THU has been further improved because, B because DOC moved it from a men's jail to the women's jail where transgender women face less harassment and abuse and are better integrated into services. There are several recommendations from the board's report that DOC should still pursue, including a planning task force with community members and additional staff training. The standards prohibit the housing placement of a transgender or intersex person based solely on the person's external genital anatomy, and they require DOC to make housing determinations on a case-by-case -case basis that considers gender identity. Today, New York City jails still rely on a determination of gender based on a person's anatomical appearance, and there is no evidence that DOC is currently considering gender identity or using a case-by-case -case approach. The city's recent announcement that DOC will begin housing by gender identity and the involvement of the Commission on Human Rights should yield significant progress. The board will monitor implementation once this begins and will publish an updated analysis on DOC's approach to housing transgender people in 2019. In the coming months, BOC will be focused on three oversight goals. First, we will continue to drive data transparency and accountability on implementation of the standards. Next week, we will release a public compliance dashboard of DOCs and Correctional Health's PREA-related reports and requirements. The board will continue working closely with the department to develop, use, and share the data needed to drive practice and policy improvements that will increase safety in the jails. Second, we will closely monitor the department's corrective action plan to close the backlog of investigations. We will monitor the quality of investigations closely by conducting annual audits. Lastly, we will continue to call on DOC to create an effective post-incident review process for, process for cases of sexual abuse. These sexual abuse incident reviews required by BOCs and federal PREA standards should involve facility staff and leadership in reviewing conditions that contributed to a substantiated or unsubstantiated complaint of sexual abuse. The reviews are intended to identify the steps needed to reduce further risk and incidents. To date, the board has only received five reports of sexual abuse incident reviews, but the standards require them for all closed investigations unless a complaint is unfounded. In closing, the board supports the council's efforts to increase transparency and reduce sexual abuse and harassment in the jails through the legislation proposed today and looks forward to working with council members on this legislation and other efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today.
Thank you. Are you, are there, is there additional testimony or taking questions? Why don't we just take questions and I, I may have something to You'll add in as we. Um, I can just have questions first. I may have something to add at the end if it's not covered. Okay, thank you. And so, um, you know, if you, I know you guys were there for part of, and I think most of the, the testimony there, I certainly was concerned about the uh, timelines for investigating uh, and also uh, hopeful but concerned about, you know, getting to February 2019 when there is a belief that they will be able to do the 90 day uh, review within the 90 days, but also sounds like then they also have, a, they have to then also take the addition, the, the current ones and then adjudicate the current ones. So I'm not sure even in February 2019 we are, we are fully there. So my first question, just, just are you, does the board feel that the department is both properly resourced and will be properly resourced and is on pace to meet the goal of by February 2019 to do a, thank you, to do a, uh, a, a 90 day review of all cases? So we believe that the corrective action plan is significant progress. So the, they definitely need to reduce their caseloads as they've said and as they intend to move towards. So they need to add more investigators, they need to add more supervisors, they need to also do a better job triaging the simple versus complex cases that come before them and, a, and do a better supervision job of the cases while they're in process to make sure that all the steps are taken, all the requirements are met, and that they're closed in a timely fashion. The department, um, obviously the plan just came out, the corrective action plan came out in June. They released some data today to you all that we hadn't heard before. Um, they're providing an update to the board in September, um, and I think as we monitor the cases that are closed each month, we'll have a better sense as to whether or not they're going to meet their target. Um, as you mentioned, there is a potential that there still will be uh, sort of a new, smaller backlog um, in March once we get there. But I think the board thought it was most pressing that the 2016 and 2017 cases be closed immediately because obviously the potential for interviewing people, gathering evidence decreases as time goes on. And the and the and I was going to ask that question at the at the but time time was not on my side. But the is what is the methodology right now by which the department is going through the cases? Is it in some time order or is it what it, you mentioned 2016, 2017 coming first? What is the process by which they are taking the backlog of cases and resolving them? Is it is it is it based on time? I don't know the answer to how they're okay. triaging Is there a recommended cases? methodology from the board in terms of how they go through those cases? Sorry, ask the question again? The, I think there was a discussion after we had heard from the Department of Correction as we were walking in here about whether they should be go doing the, the most recent cases first and going backwards or doing the 2016 cases first and 2017 to 2018. I think, the, I think it's not clear. I think you, you had just said that you're not clear whether they're taking them in any sort of order. Is there a board recommendation about how they should be handling the backlog? I, I, I don't think we, we know that. Obviously, the more serious cases should have been handled or, or, or already. This is almost a, it's, it's an embarrassment to the city, I think. When it, I'll just say, I was on the initial rulemaking for, 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 for our PREA rule um, as, as your representative on the uh, on, on, on the board, and <clears throat> at that time, can you, can you just state your name too? Sorry. I'm sorry, Bobby yeah. Cohen, uh, member of the uh, Board of Correction, um, and the the numbers were extraordinary three years ago when we started looking at it, and very very embarrassing, and there were all kinds of reasons given as to why. Uh, the, uh, the, the the process uh, didn't 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 work. I you know I think there there are at least two fundamental issues. One it's not going to answer specifically your question, but they need adequate staff. So they, they still have have positions both for investigators and for investigator supervisors, which have not been hired. They have a plan to hire them by a, by a date by a date certain, but there's should be a rush on that. There should be a prioritization. I don't believe that's a cash issue. I don't think there's a need to go to OMB to, to, to ask for that. But there, there is a need for, for, for the board and for you to pressure them to hire these people and report regularly on, on, their, on, their, on their reporting. Um, 
So, and the other is a, is a system issue, I, I think. Uh, it's our understanding, and perhaps Emily could, you know, add to this, that the, that the department does, does not, at least as far as, we're con as far as we know, because we ask for the data and can't get it, that the department does not know clearly what it needs to know to prioritize and to, and to, and to, and to push these cases through. Uh, th there's a lot of investigation that the department is required to do because of lots of problems within the department. This has to do with Nunez as well as with Priya, and they need well-functioning, integrated case management systems which will tell them on any given day, you know, given a seriousness of a certain case, where is it in the process, how far is it from 90 days, et cetera. And as far as I know, that system doesn't exist yet and would answer, I think, your question about prioritization. And, and when you say they don't know what they don't know, you, you, that's predominantly about having the correct systems for tracking? I think so. Maybe em Emily could add to that. Our understanding is that they are engaged um, in order to track any information um, that would be required for reporting. That is a very manual process. They're um, the same staff that are doing the investigation activities are the staff that are responsible for updating into sort of an access spreadsheet um, system to enter different data elements which are regularly tracked in numerous different systems. So um, whereas, uh, for example, um, under Nunez, they've developed a case management system um, for use of force cases. That's not being used for PREA investigations. The same system is not being used. There's not a separate module developed to track that information. And so the quality of the data, as I think we all recognize and have been quite frustrated by, is, is just not there. Um, the, the board requires um, semi-annual reports, not only the public reports that they, uh, that they are required to release every uh, six months, but individual level data on every single allegation for each six month period, as well as updates on prior allegations from prior reporting periods is required to be submitted to the board and to date none of the individual level data that we have received um, we have not been able to reconcile that individual level data with any of the public reports that have been released publicly by the department. So you've asked for it, they haven't given you? We've asked for it, we've met with them in person, we've sent, we've crosswalked everything required under the standards with what they've submitted and highlighted all deficiencies, we've met with them in person. Um, they've reported to us that they have added data elements which we highlighted were missing. They've added it to their spreadsheet, but um, the last semi-annual individual level data was due to the board on August 14th with the release of the public report, and we have yet to receive it. Got it. And um, is this information you're asking for required in PREA, or is this a board requested information? Um, required under 540 of the board's PREA standards. Got it. What are the penalties under, under PREA for non-compliance? I'll, I'll address that. They're they're de, de minimis, I would say, and 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 although the department is committed to getting PREA compliance from the from the Department of Justice uh, PREA compliance givers, uh, that should not be of importance to the council and is and is not important to the board because the law that you're that you're considering and the rule that we have that we that we have that we have passed um, are are require reporting and, and, and practice which would, would not be identified in a PREA compliance audit. There are national concerns about that process. This was, PREA was, a, was something that involved 50 states, many, many jurisdictions, and got watered down a lot in the process of, of auditing it. So it's very important that a local process, as you're doing right now and, and as we do, um, be available to assure sexual you know, safety in the, in, the, in the jails. So there's, there's there, I think the, the, the penalty for noncompliance is that you have to give back a certain amount of money which the department has received to get PREA compliant. So they give, the federal government gives money, DOJ federal government you know, for, money. for the department to hire the Moss Agency and others to train, to train people to do this audit. If you fail compliance, then you have to give some part of that money back. The reason the public advocate petitioned the board to 
at least copy the federal pre-regulations into local law through the board standards and then to add on to them. And the reason the board passed them was to create an enforcement and monitoring mechanism at the local level, uh, which went well beyond what the federal PREA regulations so then, have. So then what is the enforcement at the local level if they're not being compliant? So the, the enforcement is the same as with any of the board standards. I mean, the department is required to follow and comply with the standards. People can bring private rights of action, Article 78s, when DOC or correctional health fail to comply with their obligations. We have hearings like this. We issue reports about when there is compliance and when there is not compliance. There's corrective action plans and resolutions passed to try to bring the Department or Correctional Health into compliance and enforce the standards that way. And they're out of compliance today, you agree? Uh, generally. On the, on the 42 standards in this area? Yeah. So. Yeah, what, which ones are, how many are they out of compliance with? Today. That's a great question. So next week there will be a public dashboard that will go through all of the reporting requirements and then subsequently there will be a public dashboard that will go through all 42 substantive uh, components of the standards. Um, so I, I would, it would be not prudent of me to speak to their compliance on all of the standards so, so today. So next week you'll have a public dashboard on, I presume on your website? That, that will, on reporting requirements. Correct, not on each substantive standard. So next week there is a public uh, board meeting where this will be a t topic um, at the meeting. The, a lot of the focus will be on the compliance with public reporting, this compliance dashboard, as well as the audit that we're going to release of the closing memos of uh, 42 files. Okay. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to, yeah, Rory Lanterne is not a question, but I, I wanted to pass it over to the chair. I just said I want to just cover one more topic, and then I'll come back to some of some things. Our report. So, um, one thing we didn't get to cover previously is visitors who are coming to uh, to visit a family member or see see a loved one or whatever. whatever. So, um, it, it, that's not covered in any of the reporting requirements, visitor uh, allegations or reporting. No, so the ab abuse of uh, visitors, harassment of visitors um, would not fall into our standards, just like it's not part of pre the federal PREA regulations. And so if... Um, oh, uh, can I just make one more statement? Course, so yeah. obviously we do have other standards that touch upon the visiting process at great length, uh, but not specifically on the issue of sexual abuse or harassment. There's no reporting requirements that we have on that. We are supportive um, of the proposed legislation today. I think. We believe it's very important that we all have a much better sense of the magnitude and the details of the issues that we're hearing about um, in the news and from particular cases and from your work on, on the issue. Um, generally, the board does monitor visits and visit conditions and in many other areas. When we receive complaints of sexual abuse, we are required to, by staff, required to send that to the Department of Investigation. I think we, we received two such complaints in 2018. Those went to DOI. Um, and anyway, we continue to focus on visiting through a monthly report on visits, as well as sort of ongoing public discussions at, at meetings. And we've given recommendations to the department about their, their visit practices and their directive. And we welcome, you know, working with council members and council staff on all of that, those discussions. And I would just like issue. to add to that, if I can. I think it's important, and I, I believe this is not in your proposed uh, uh, rule so far, um, that, the, that the information being collected regarding complaints of, 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 of sexual abuse or harassment in the visit process include the specific facility, not just the whole, the whole department, the time that, 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 that it occurred, um, uh, so that, so that the department will have the advantage <laughs> of knowing where, if there are hot spots in, yeah, term, in terms patterns of patterns yes. may exist. Okay, no, I appreciate that. Um, and if, but if you're visiting today and you feel like something improper happened and you can call three, can you still use the same reporting mechanisms if you're a visitor, like 311 and the, the, there's hotlines and staff and things like that. Like you mentioned, you have two that came to the board that went to DOI. There's other methods by which someone could say, I had a bad interaction here and maybe potentially criminal, and those don't reach you, but there, is a, there are available. And do those go, would you know what the process is by how the, once someone reports who's a visitor, is it the same process as somebody who
does it, you know, that is, is covered by PREA and so forth? So, um, visitors can certainly call 311, um, and then that would be routed back to the department because it would be related to something that happened at the department, and then from there, um, that would trigger their PREA reporting, um, their process of any kind of criminal activity, which is the same as for all city employees to refer it to DOI for investigation. So if, if a visitor called 311 and complained that they were inappropriately searched, for example, and it was routed to the department, they would then report it to DOI. That's our understanding of the process. Okay, have you, has the board considered any, any additional rules or rulemaking around visitors in terms of Report. I mean, in addition, we obviously have a bill before us today, but any anything around visitors? Because we've heard leading into the hearing some anecdotes around um, concerns about uh, about visitors and um, <coughs> and making sure there's appropriate protections for them as well, which I think isn't covered by the by the federal reporting requirements. But certainly, a lot of folks who are who are coming from the public to visit and. They also have reporting. Have you guys considered any any additional rules around visitors? Um, we'd be happy to talk through what that would look like and and make some consideration of, of that. There has been a visit committee, which of which board members and have participated with DOC staff, but nothing that would rise to the level of rulemaking action. I, I believe that the current process of having cameras in the during the, the frisking process is relatively new, and is something that we that we that we supported. It's complex because someone some people do complain to us even that they don't want to be Video. photographed. Yeah, right, right. When they're when they're when they're being pat for so that's a complex a complex issue. Got it. And 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 uh, uh, one question before I, I hand it off the time requirement for closing out a complaint only today exists for if it's a pre categories as a PREA complaint. Is am I correct about that? For Under our standards, yeah. Yes. Have, has you, have you considered including non-PREA into adding a time requirement onto non-PREA complaints? The, that was extensively contemplated when the board was developing its rules. And what was the, can you and inform the, us and, more and on the discussion? And then the board decided to follow more closely the definitions under the federal regulations. And any Following the pre And why was that? I, I don't recall exactly. I think it, I, I'm sure it had something to do with the volume, um, you know, that, 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 was, that was at issue there. Got it. Um, um, okay, uh, I think Councilmember Rosenthal Oh, she had to step out into the committee, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, you know, I think that we heard about an equal level of 1,000 open back, a backlog of about 1,000 cases that are PREA categorized and then non-PREA. So um, I continue to be concerned that people are getting appropriate uh, are getting appropriate attention to something that they feel like happened to them. And I know we have different categories here, but certainly would, would think about considering again, maybe, maybe at the point where the backlog is, is you know, cleared and on pace, um, also thinking through timelines around for people who have other, other complaints that maybe aren't categories is Priya. Well, one of the concerns we have about um, the non-PREA, again, is this definition, which you asked about yeah. earlier. Um, one of the things that we find problematic with the 540 public report that the department has, um, that the department submitted back in March, is this definition of non-PREA incidents to include these one-time gestures, but also to include um, um, allegations stemming from a proper pat frisk. Um, and so it's not clear to us what they're um, triaging process is at what point are they determining this is non PREA because this was a proper pat, pat frisk? Like it strikes us as requiring some level of investigation to determine that. And so, um, auditing and getting to the bottom of what is in this non PREA category would be important for us to understand if we were to um, propose rules. Um, around the non PREA. So the ability to sort out, sort the, the categories out, is that right? Well, we don't understand um, how they are currently determining something as a proper pat frisk. Um, oh, so so what what goes into non what goes into that category at all? Right, right. 
we, right, and the board made that clear in their public discussions, and I think that the staff, the board staff and DOC staff, in, in a lot of the discussions around data that are quite detailed, um, are having a discussion about what is counted as a PREA complaint versus a non-PREA reportable complaint. And I expect that the board will have a lot more to say on the topic. The board obviously wants to see every complaint uh, investigated in the same serious manner and closed. Um, and I think there is a sense that we cannot determine what is non-PREA reportable versus what is PREA reportable until an investigation is conducted and closed. So that, that, that are, there is some disagreement, I think, um, which we're trying to work through in discussions with the department on those definitions and the process for categorizing. Understood. And, and you've contemplated rules on that, or you're trying to help them figure out it's, how to be? I mean, it's possible the majority of these cases would already fall under our existing rules. Um, right. We need to do some further investigation to understand how they're categorizing the non-PREA cases. Gotcha. Um, you, some, just can you describe to us more um, some of the concerns you had about the quality and the objectiveness of the DOC's investigations and allegations? I'm going to start, and then Martha's going to add. Um, you know, one of the one of the concerns that we've had from the beginning. Um, when we've looked at this, and I don't know what more recent uh, analysis will, will show, is that there are lots of reasons for delays, and, and that the delay means that no, there are no consequences, as you pointed out, either consequences in, in terms of you know responding to someone's you know injury or discipline within the department. And we, you know, we're as frustrated as you were in the answers that you got to the questions you were trying to ask about how many people were disciplined. You know, we know, we know that in 2015, when we started this process, there had been maybe two or three cases that had gone to, to the district attorney out of thousands. And we don't know if that's changed. And I could not tell, because we had not seen a lot of this information before, what those, what the numbers today go in terms of things getting to the, to the district attorney. But there are issues about... That is required by our, currently required by our standards, but it is not been adequately reported to us to date. So you're is required, but you're not getting the information no. you want. And also there, I mean, among the issues of concern, and I don't think, and I don't know that the, I'm not suggesting there be a modification of the rule here, because it's quite complicated. For example, if you wanted to interview a correction officer, then there has to be, they, they, they legitimately have one of their, their a union, re, re, union lawyer present. Mm -hmm. There are delays that occur, substantial delays that, that occur because of the absence of adequate uh, staff to do, to, you know, this, this comes out in Nunez all the time and it gets complicated, uh, you know, by, by, it doesn't get complicated, but it's just as a fact, if you're going to investigate these cases in PREA, then that requires additional, additional support. So lots of delays happen there, but those delays are, um, are extremely problematic, as you've described, because testimony can change over time, people's stories have, lots of time to get organized when there are delays in the in, in the investigation process so I, I mean we've, we've tried through the 90-day rule to, to 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 make this as good as we can and that's sort of I think we're we're confident that that's a reasonable but approach now yeah appreciate that and I share the I share the comment about the 90 days and and certainly anything we can do to be helpful to to eliminate delays obviously so much staffing and funding and things like that i think though we, we'd be supportive of um one of the things we talked about in 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 the the previous testimony was you know we're, we're obviously talking about a lot of corrective measures to take to help reduce backlog address uh, outstanding complaints and allegations but not talking probably enough about how to actually prevent incidents that are happening and one of the things that we have, we have we do have we have definitional problems across the board here we're not getting enough information we're not um we're not be able to define it because we're not getting cases closed so we don't know how persistent the problem is and i think that we've heard from the department you know, their belief that the high, the allegations are high, but the substantiation is low, but even with a backlog, it's hard to make, you know, clarity to that. Um, how, do you guys have, does the board have recommendations in terms of, or, or can you talk to us about any, any sort of ideas that have been discussed 
around not just addressing backlogs and taking and taking an approach to reduce um, uh, and to increase reporting, things like that, but to actually take preventative measures. We, uh, we hear from the department a bit about some belief of how they think the new jails might improve this, but you know, across the board, how to either in physical design or through lawmaking, rulemaking, or or through the, just through the department, how to how to be uh, how to improve prevent how to be more preventative in terms of abuse. So uh, we think that you know if the 42 standards are adhered to, if they're implemented, they do cover education, training, prevention, detection, surveillance, cameras, rounds, staffing. I mean, it covers plenty of issues that should uh, deal with prevention. I think the board also believes fundamentally that it is critical to prevention that investigations are effective and closed because if they are not, there will not be any accountability and there won't be any potential deterrence of sexual abuse or harassment in the future. So I think we want to be sure to categorize investigations and the focus on investigations as also contributing to prevention efforts um, fundamentally. I, I also think that the, in my testimony, speaking to the issue of sexual abuse incident reviews, um, those are a process that is supposed to look at an event and identify where policy and practice went wrong in that facility, in that incident, to make sure that recommendations and steps are taken to prevent anything similar from happening again. I think the board, you, you know, believes in that kind of sentinel event review process and, and the value of, of looking at these incidents to make sure that anything similar doesn't happen again. Um, Similarly, the, the work that the board has done on screening and really identifying, classifying, and housing people based on their potential risk for abusing other people or for being abused themselves is, is critical. Um, the board has also uh, taken a great interest in the issues related to protective custody and will be looking more at that issue um, in the coming year, and that is also fundamentally about um, the housing and classification of people and keeping people safe, and it does relate to all of these sexual abuse and harassment issues as well. Thank you. And on the screenings issue, you noticed you guys noted deficiencies in in the in the um, in the department's use of screenings. So are there places where you recommend further further either information that's gathered by them at the beginning of in the screening process? Is there, is there other staffing issues there? What are the what are the um, in terms of addressing those deficiencies, in terms of screening appropriately, um, yeah, good. I think so the most fundamental deficiency back in October 2017, when this came up, uh, was the fact that the only information about someone's risk of sexual victimization was on a piece of paper, and that piece of paper was in a file somewhere, and the information was not shared in a timely fashion with all of the staff or all of the people who needed that information. Thus, the, the department required that that kind of information, the screening around this issue, be electronic so that the information could be adequately kept in the inmate management system and available in real time to people when they need it to make housing programming decisions. That has happened. So that is really extremely great progress. Um, the fact that the department can quantify, can identify um, individuals and can quantify at an aggregate level where people are at risk, where people are at risk of abusing others, they have a much better sense of that right now. Um, so we're still monitoring what further impact that will have um, and whether or not there are additional improvements to the use of the screening uh, tool that, that need to be um, taken up by the department. So they, can I just ask a follow-up question on that, the paper process? Um, can you detail, just, just tell me a little bit more about that process? So they, they, would, they would screen you upon intake. They would have a paper record in terms of categories, risk categories here, and that would go, that would go into a file that was stored away not an electronic system. So if I wanted to, if I needed to move you to another unit, were they then, what is the process by which they were tracking in terms of they, it sounds like they, this was like a process from the 19, I mean, pick a decade in the early 1900s. would be best equipped to answer these questions in particular. I, I believe there, that that piece of paper was kept in a person custody's general file that would move with them 
um, you know, from facility to facility or wherever they were. I mean, the board knew this was a problem because of the board's requirements to track the placement of transgender people. And so we were attempting to track the placement of transgender people, but we're, we're only able, we're, we're sort of given hundreds of pages of screenings of just pages of everyone who was coming into custody. There was no way to separate out who was trans, who was not, who was at sexual, uh, who was at risk of sexual victimization or not. And um, that led to the resolution, the corrective action plan, and now, um, thankfully, a um, electronic method for this. I, I would just, I mean, I think your fundamental question is critical, and, and I would just, you know, the opening statements of this committee reflected a, a very important process in that. I think, you know, just recognizing that this is not to be trivialized, this is not to be, that sexual abuse in prisons is not be, to be a joke or to be norm, normalized is really, is really critical. It's, it's rhetorical to say it, but it's, it's more than that. When the board develops rules and you're here doing, doing things, decreasing the total numbers are, are, are important. Uh, as, as well, the city's human rights policy on, on tra transgender, I think, in, will affect lots of lot, lots of things. And the fact that it's not okay, um, I think there is a you know we we've met as the board with the Bronx DA to talk about the need for them to to act on this and not to not to not to be passive and um, and that's another that's another area that we can work on. Yeah. Well, merely having it in an electronic format will allow us to measure compliance with not only just the screen the screening, the fact that they're doing the screening, but where are they housing individuals? Are they appropriately se separating individuals? That will allow us to understand much more about how they're managing different populations um, who are at risk or yeah. potentially at risk. I just want to add one more thing to that. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's very important. And what's important in terms of your, your, your laws and our, and our rules is, is less about our monitoring of the process than the department, than, than we make rules and you make laws that, that help the department, that the department uses as part of their, their practice, not for us to, 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 to beat them over the head for failure, but rather that the kind of data that you require makes their work better. I, I could have said it better myself. I, uh, and I will say very frankly, we're, I don't think we are here to shame. We're not here to shame the, anybody. We are here to actually correct things that we think are mistakes. Um, on the on transgender housing, uh, I was reading through your testimony. The stand there. I, I, I'm just noting that you had mentioned standards prohibit housing to placement of trans or intersex persons based solely on the person's external general anatomy require DOC to make a housing determination on a case-by-case -case basis that considers gender identity. Sounds like they're not doing that today. Can you tell us about their, their, um, uh, their compliance with that standard? And is there any measure that they will, uh, you guys are monitoring it, I think a public analysis, but has the, has the department actually come up with any set of rules to actually become moving into compliance. Like with the backlog, we've heard, okay, we have a deadline to actually meet compliance here. Right. Um, so we believe that the announcement from the city and the involvement of the Commission on Human Rights and DOC's agreement to begin housing by gender identity by October 13th, that is the deadline that's been public for some months that they've been aiming towards. So when that occurs, they will be uh, compliant with our standards. And that will be on a case-by-case -case basis? It, no, everybody should be housed by gender identity unless on a case-by-case -case basis there is some security concern. Right, 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 right. It, it's broader. So the, the commitment from the city and DOC and Commission on Human Rights goes beyond the board standards. Right, right, right. Got it. But in a good way. Um, okay, and, and I want to just go through, lastly, just because you guys had mentioned a couple of recommendations that you had made, things like a, I'm sorry, I'm picking them up here, like a, like a, like a task force, a planning task force with community members, additional staff training. Can you go through us the recommendations that the board had made um, in terms of housing and, and identity and housing safety and identity. There are several recommendations in the board's report that DLC should still pursue. Can you outline those for us? Sure. Um, so uh, the report that the board released in February included 
um, a number of detailed recommendations about the application process. Some of those recommendations have been addressed through the corrective action in response to the October resolution of improved screening and improving the application process. So um, whereas before people would just sort of um, uh, happen to get an application if they were lucky enough to talk to the right officer, the screening process now includes an automatic sharing of the THU application. So some of those recommendations around the application process for the THU have gone hand in hand with the improvements um, on the uh, screening process. Other recommendations that came out of the report were for um, the department to convene a task force that would include um, trans-focused organizations um, and the community to provide in, um, input and as to how the unit could be operating better, what kinds of programmings could be operated. Um, some With the movement of the THU to ROSIES, some of the recommendations around improvements um, related to programming and access to um, commissary issues that were coming to the board's attention via complaints from people in the THU um, will be addressed and have already been addressed by moving the THU to ROSIES. Um, other recommendations um, were around training of staff and the department is now reporting that all ROSIES staff will receive um, focus on working with um, the transgender community. So many of the recommendations that came out of the report are um, either um, already underway or being implemented by the department or um, will, will soon be implemented. Fair. Right, I know there are other recommendations that have not, are not in the process of meeting the recommendation. So, I mean, I think there are still ways the department can improve the application process. I think the form that's now given to everyone to apply to the THU could be further improved. So they've taken some important key initial steps, but I think actually seeing it through and um, convening that task force, the department hasn't committed to that doing that publicly yet. So that's something that we'll be following up with them um, at the next board meeting on. Um, I think it's the task force and training. I mean, I guess they've made a new commitment to training, um, but I think those would be the areas of focus that are still outstanding from the report. Uh, thanks. And on, on, a, on a broader topic around training, does, do, do you feel that the employees of the Department of Correction today are getting adequate training in terms of um, sexual abuse, harassment, and sort of all the issues that we're discussing today. I, they, they noted the amount of training they're getting, but certainly that's, that's, there's also quality of the training as well, in terms of the amount of hours they're getting, how often they're getting it, uh, what type of training, of course. Um, do you believe they're getting adequate, staff is getting adequate training? And that, that includes officers, health staff, anybody who's working there? Um, so we, we think that's a really important question. Um, and so, in order to answer that, we have observed the training and now we're in the process of um, generating what will sort of our conclusions from observing a, a wide variety of days of training of different levels of staff in different places. We're going to bring that all together and um, would, would be happy to send you our, our findings about the quality of the training um, as we also need to send those to DOC. And then you'll make a recommendation about how to improve training? Sure. That, Is that a yes, yes or a no? Will, yes. Okay. We will and, do that. and are they required to adopt those standards or is it? Uh, you mean a recommendation? If you make a recommendation, yeah, sorry. You know, I'm just <laughs> not just to defend the department. <laughs> I mean, when we talked about training for PREA, mm -hmm. we're talking about training 10,000 people. Yeah. It's a gigantic process. So uh, I think, I think we will, I think, our standards require training. I think they were, you know, I don't know if they require retraining. That is maybe something that we will have to have to have to look at over 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 over, over time. But um, the department has made a dramatic commitment to this process here, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing. I personally have not observed the training. Okay. Do you have an answer? Okay. Uh, I mean, we certainly, I think, would appreciate getting more insights into uh, the feelings around the training, both the 
availability of it, the timing of it, the frequency of it, and um, and the quality of it, because we certainly would provide, you know be interested in working with the board and the department on ensuring that the people that are working there are getting appropriate training, and uh, and and also how to have, obviously how to report if they see something as well that's happening that requires it, and any other standards that would improve safety and security. Because I think it's I think it's again like I, I'm certainly I, I share the belief that having a fair and, and process that's working helps eliminate and prevent. But I but I also feel that, you know, we wanna we wanna be more you know focus on the upfront prevention as much as the backlog and the you know so forth and so on. Um, the last question is um, I, we asked this at budget hearings but I like to ask it anyway. What is the how does the board feel they are properly resourced to do oversight in this area? Um Right now, yes. You feel your property. I'll take this opportunity to compliment the board. I mean, it's really a pleasure to be on, to be a member of the board, but the staff are doing, I mean, I think you can hear an extraordinary amount of work in this area. And I haven't heard requests for more staff, but, but, but the, but the, the, the council has supported, the, you know, the, the substantial expansion of the board. And I think people are working very hard because there's a lot to cover, but. Really, our, our issues now are getting the data. <laughs> Got it. We share that. We are we are um, we're going to be requesting more data from them, and we appreciate it. And uh, as always, uh, we'll we'll look forward to working together in terms of clarifying data, improving standards, and ensuring that nobody in our custody is is uh, feels unsafe at any point in time, and that they get adjudicated appropriately. So, thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you very much. Oh, we we have Councilmember Rosenthal coming back. If we can. If we can hold and give her an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Powers. Uh, I apologize for stepping out uh, at the same time we're having a hearing about um, the, the Committee on Immigration is having a hearing about uh, the incredible need to abolish ICE. I have a resolution calling on the uh, city to uh, be in support of the federal legislation that would do just that. So with apologies for stepping away and gratitude for your asking a couple of my questions. Um, I just wanna add uh, uh, very quickly, and I, I didn't hear the answer to one of these, so I'm gonna ask you to repeat it. Um, so, so you're in support of the um, new housing unit for um, people who identify as transgender? Yes. Okay. And, um, sorry. Oh, great, thank you. Um, how are uh, incarcerated individuals made aware of this unit? Do you know? So right now, um, the department is, uh, as a result of the board's resolution in October 2017, now um, has implemented an electronic screening tool, um, and then anyone who screens as identifying as transgender or intersex um, or um, at risk of sexual victimization would be shared, automatically shared an application to the transgender housing unit. Um, and then um, their, um, the outcome of that screening is now tracked electronically. Do you know if anyone is not moved over for any reason, if it's requested? Um, yes, so there's an individual determination, a sort of case-by-case -case determination based on um, how they screen on the 
PREA screening tool as well as other security considerations. So there's um, a number of factors that go into that decision. Do you know if there are wait lists to get in? We're not aware of any wait list. Um, I, your line of questioning is reminding me of something also very important. For a recommend, we were talking about our THU report and another recommendation that came out of that report was to um, create a viable appeal process for people yeah. um, so that if they weren't able to get into the unit and they wanted to be in the unit, there was um, a trustworthy, clear, transparent appeal process. And that is something that um, still needs to occur. Um, but we're not aware of any wait list. And right now, the, the department is reporting on, um, is sending us each THU application. Um, so we can see the determination on, on an individual level as well right now. But an appeal process would be very important, I think, to sort of the issue you're speaking to. Can, can you, you please? Um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the past, uh, I, when I visited the unit, when it was, at, when it was in Manhattan, uh, there were serious problems with the steadiness of the staff and the training of the staff. And that is something that's being, that we believe, we hope, is being addressed when it's, in, when it's in, at Rosie's, but that's something that's very important, that there be steady staff for this process. Also to note, uh, when the department announced that it was going to close the unit, the population went from about 12 or 13 down to 7. Uh, the board um, re responded to that, as did many other people, and, uh, the, the, and then as well as the Human Rights Commission of the city. And when that decision was reversed, the population went, went from 12 to 7 approximately, and now it's back up to 13. So, um, so I'm sure during that period your concerns were, were absolutely um, valid. I hope they're not right now. Um, we, don't, we don't know that, that, that there's any n numeric limitation in terms of the capacity of, our, of, of, our, of Rosie's to, and there, are, there we were at least in the past couple of weeks uh, both um, trans, trans um, women both in a dormitory and in a cell setting. Right now it's all dormitory, is that right? I believe so. I think also just um, as Martha mentioned for the appeal process, but, but also for the application process, the application process is not being tracked electronically, which does require um, a lot of manual review. Um, the board standards require a report on all transgender placements. We've been receiving those um, bi-weekly since November, since the board um, sort of drew a line in the sand with the resolution in October. Um, so we've been receiving those reports, but that is still a very manual paper-based review process for the actual application. So while it's great that the screening, um, the outcome of the screening is now electronically captured, we don't have the same advantage in terms of analyzing and reviewing the actual application. So that would kind of go part and parcel with just broader recommendations of better electronic screening or better electronic tracking and case management um, recommendations. So not only for investigations, case management, but also for um, managing applications in the appeal process just um, so that we can um, track it and monitor it more closely. And verify. Right. Um, have you heard anecdotally stories of people who want to be housed separately who are not? We've heard um, the board, you know, has staff in each facility, and so where um, wherever the wherever the transgender housing unit has been, we've um, our staff has uh, received complaints from people in custody regarding the unit. But I think um, since it's been moved, there have been um, a few issues that have brought, been brought to our staff's attention. But in general, um, what we're hearing from uh, people who are housed in the transgender housing unit is that overall this movement to Rosie's has been a very positive move. Okay. So I get the sense you can't quite determine whether or not DOC is compliant, but you're asking them to report electronically with more information so you could determine if they are compliant. Am I hearing you right? Um, so, and, and let me just confirm, th there is no appeals process currently? Uh, there is an appeals process in the directive that governs the transgender housing unit right now. 
uh, but the appeal committee is essentially the same committee as the admission committee. So uh, we made some specific recommendations to try to make it more impartial and objective. Um, so we just changes to that. We, the transgender housing unit directive is under review um, at, the, at the department right now for updating um, and revision. So potentially this could be something that they add to their upcoming directive. And we've asked for a copy of their directive prior to it um, being implemented so that we can review and provide feedback. So have there been any cases of someone who's appealed to the committee who's then reversed themselves? Do you or know? the committee has changed their mind? Yeah. I uh, mean, does so anyone what was happening, win an appeal? What we found was that um, there was no appeal process that individuals would just fill out another application. So the department was not implementing their own policy and um, individuals in custody were being left to just repeatedly file applications um, over and over again rather than actually receive a determination. And that's one of the findings in the report um, was that the determinations were not being shared back with the individuals in custody. Oh, wow. So they would submit an application and not know why they were or weren't moved. It just, if they were lucky, they, they would make it to the THU. If not, they had no idea and their only recourse was to file another application. And just to confirm, um, uh, do, you, do they report on any, do they report on the number of people who appeal and the number that they determine to be able to be moved or not? No, but every two weeks they send us um, information about the movement of any person who's identified as transgender on the screening tool. So the movement and the initial placement, we receive information about that every so, two weeks. Okay, so if somebody identifies and they agree to write it down in the report, <laughs> which they may or may not do in terms of the report they send to you, they send you the report saying these are the people who uh, identified as trans and we moved them all over. The report is about the movement and the placement itself. We don't know about how many people they, that wanted to be moved that weren't moved. Okay. All and right. we've never seen DOC documentation of even an appeal form. Okay. We've never, we don't know that such a form even exists. It doesn't appear to. Okay, and I'm hearing, oh, go ahead. I'm just gonna add that the, the so the board cares, one, about the, the quality and the availability of the transgender housing unit, and that's one issue which, I guess we're focused on right now, and we are not aware of any appeals to a, a decision to come into the THU. So we don't believe there's been any formal appeals Thank to you. date. And then second, secondarily, the board also cares very much about the placement of all transgender people, whether or not they're in the THU or if they're in protective custody or any facility, any type of housing. And so what we're trying to do is also get very good data and reporting on that broader issue. And in 2019, we'll issue an analysis of the approach to housing transgender people generally across everywhere, including in the THU, but also at a higher level. And that kind of analysis wasn't previously possible because there was no um, flag or universal way of identifying people who identified as transgender. I really want to thank you guys for uh, all of your work every day. Um, you are truly the unsung heroes trying to, uh, you know, make sure DOC does the right thing. I, I don't envy you. I really thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you for spending time asking, answering questions, and we'll look forward to continue to work with you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to hear from the next panel. I have uh, four folks here, and then we have, I think, two subsequent panels. Uh, the first one is Kiara Montero Reyes, Kendra Clark, Tanya Krupat from the Osborne Association, and Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies JAC. Are those folks all here?
Thank you. Are we waiting for one more? We'll, we'll get started either way. But uh, so just before you start, just uh, please state your name, any association, organization, affiliation. Uh, we're going to have two minutes, and then we may have questions for each for each person uh, to testify. Uh, please try to stay within the, the two minutes. Um, certainly, if you are close to ending, you can certainly make note of that, and we will uh, then potentially have some follow-up questions. So thank you, and uh, we'll go uh, we'll go your right to left. So we'll start over here. Thank you. Hi. So my name agency. Okay. Um, my name is. Oh, go ahead. You don't, have to, you don't have to do the only agencies have to do it. Thanks. Um, okay. So good morning. My name is Karen Montero Reyes. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm a clinician with the Still Survivors Program at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, which is an organi a crisis organization that serves LGBTQ identified survivors of violence through counseling, legal services, and advocacy. Still Survivors is a program in collaboration with Steps Stand Family Violence, an agency that has served criminalized survivors of intimate partner violence for over 30 years. In this role, I work with survivors of intersecting forms of violence in the community and at Rikers. Thank you to the Committee on Criminal Justice, the Committee on the Justice System, and the Committee on Women for the opportunity to testify. Uh, though efforts to tackle sexual violence within carceral systems do exist, more progress must be made in order to acknowledge, report, and hold perpetrators accountable for sexual violence. Through my work with AVP and STEPS, I provide counseling and advocacy services to LGBTQ survivors of violence whose criminalization and incarceration is linked to their survival of violence. Uh, we have seen sexual violence being overlooked when it involves folks whose perceived or disclosed sexual orientation is non-heterosexual, um, especially since they are held within facilities of the same gender. Through our work with the community, we know that officers and other facility staff have coerced incarcerated people to exchange sexual favors for protection. This particularly happens to trans and gender nonconforming folks detained within these systems. The National Institute of Corrections reported in its 2013 Policy Review and Development Guide on LGBTQI people that incarcerated trans people are 13 times more likely than their cisgender peers to experience sexual assault. Um, two minutes. Uh, so there are specific policies and procedures that have allowed for mistreatment when responding to reports of sexual violence. Um, more so the theme that we're trying to get at is that when incarcerated people report or want to report sexual violence they've experienced in the jail system, they must be able to define what safety looks like for them. Um, survivors don't experience forced movement within the housing units as protection. Instead, it feels like retaliation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll have, do everybody and then we'll ask questions. Thanks. We'll reset uh, to two minutes as well. Yep, you can go ahead. Thank you. My name is Kendra Clark. At 33 years old, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, sexual abuse, PTSD, substance use, prolonged incarceration, and neglected mental health needs. Born in a small town in Illinois to a home plagued by the same issues, I had little opportunity to observe healthy lifestyle habits. At 10 years old, drugs and alcohol were the only coping mechanisms available to suppress the symptoms of the trauma I experienced. I was very angry about what had happened to me and didn't know how to respond. I lacked a support system to confide in. I didn't have anyone to coach me on how to um overcome my anger, lack of self-worth, depression, and constant fear for my safety. As a result, it was only a matter of time before my path led to the criminal justice system. At the age of 15, I was first arrested for a curfew violation, an offense based on my age known as a status offense. Status offenses impact people at a young age, but the trauma of the arrest and experience lasts a lifetime, driving people directly into our carceral system. I spent the next decade cycling in and out of the legal system, battling substance use and experiencing homelessness, all while suffering from untreated trauma and mental health needs. In 2010, I spent four months, including my 25th birthday, detained on Rikers Island before being sentenced and transferred to a New York State Correctional Facility. The incarceratory practices used on Rikers Island exasperated my symptoms of trauma while inflicting additional harm. Each and every night I spent on Rikers, I was fearful for my life and my body. It was not the other woman I was incarcerated with that I feared. For me, it was the male correctional officers who had watched me go to the bathroom through the window in my cell each day. 
or the officers that would use flashlights to watch me for several minutes while I tried to cover my body to lay underneath the sheet, sweating in nearly a 100 degrees cell the size of a closet. It was feeling, the feeling of being trapped, knowing that if I covered the window in my cell door with a piece of paper for even a second of privacy, I would receive a ticket and be sent to solitary confinement. It was paralyzing fear of going to solitary confinement at an officer's whim and unimaginable torture that I knew I could not handle. It was the constant exposure to derogatory and sexist comments, harassing remarks, and abusive language that fueled the demeaning environment on a daily basis. It was the absolute power that correctional officers, particularly male officers, held over me and the fact that there was no one there to report the abuse and neglect to. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. I stand with millions of other women whose uh, stories of violence, abuse, and trauma have common threads. Um, as we've discussed here, the intersectionality between trauma, sexual assault, and incarceration is clearly evident, and we have the opportunity to transform our carceral systems. And let me skip ahead, because this is way longer than two minutes. Um, and today I work at the Fortune Society, and I have some recommendations that I would like to offer, uh, beginning with the design of the new borough-based facilities and how they should be responsive to the women that they're serving or the LGBTQAI community that they're serving. And that uh, involves programming, space, staffing, oversight. It really runs the whole gamut of it. Um, an additional and minimum, so I feel you can, all... You can slow down, so. Okay, you can, keep, you can keep going. But uh, at minimum, all DOC staff should be trained to engage women using trauma-informed care and intimate partner violence-sensitive practices. Uh, diversion and alternative to incarceration programs must be considered in lieu of incarceration, reducing the amount of time women are exposed to Rikers Island. Uh, collaboration between DOC and women-led nonprofit organizations to create an oversight committee to review all sexual assault and harassment allegations. And while I understand the City Council cannot reform the New York State bail statute, the Council can fund partner organizations to educate judges and district attorneys about the issues impacting violent survivors in an effort to expand the court's use of supportive services in the community rather than setting bail for this population. As a Fortune employee, member of Just Leadership and Women's Community Justice Project, I am eager to work alongside the City Council to dismantle Rikers Island in a thoughtful way, ensuring that the culture of violence, harassment, sexual assault, and dehumanization comes to an end for everyone. Thank you today for letting me testify. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good afternoon, I'm Kelly Grace Price with the Close Roses campaign and with the Jails Action Coalition. And I'd like to thank Kendra Clark for appearing today and giving her brave testimony. It's really nice to hear fresh voices in these rooms. You know my story. I was thrown on Rikers as an innocent survivor. I've been complaining about Cyvance for years. Had some recent wins actually in federal court, FYI. Um, but I'd, I'd like to start my testimony today um, reading uh, someone else's words from their sexual assault. Uh, you may recall that I avoided sexual assault, that I was targeted by a doctor who's now being prosecuted by the Bronx DA, but thankfully I avoided that sexual assault while I was on Rikers Island. Um, but these are the words of another woman. I was arrested at an anti-war demonstration in New York City. I was in prison for, for four days before a judge released me on my own recognizance. In jail, all the orifices in my body, including mouth, vagina, and rectum, were searched many times by hand by many persons. I was told the jailers were looking for heroin. My clothes were taken away because I was wearing pants and a men's sweatshirt. I was given a flimsy robe that had no buttons or hooks. There, were, there was no way to close it. My bra, underpants, and the sash to the robe were taken away so I wouldn't kill myself. For four days, I had nothing else to wear. To see whether I had syphilis, I, would, I was examined by two male doctors. They never did the blood test for syphilis. Instead, they drew blood from my vagina. The brutal internal examination they forced on me, my first, caused me to bleed for 15 days. When I finally decided it wasn't my period, my family doctor attacked a turn man whom I had never seen express emotion even as he treated my mother's heart attacks, strokes, and experimental heart surgery, said he had never seen a uterus so bruised or a vagina so ripped. He cried. I was 18. I came out of jail unable to speak. This is a frequent res response to sexual abuse, but in 1965, 
No one knew that. Sexual abuse wasn't just on, sexual abuse wasn't on anyone's map that day until feminists redrew the map. These words were by a very famous person, Andrea Dworkin, whose testimony in front of the Senate Page Committee in 1966 caused Mayor Lindsay to decry the women's house of de detention where we used to house our mothers, our daughters, our grandmothers, our aunts, our nieces, and our nephews, <laughs> some of them. Um, and in the next year, in 1967, Mayor Lindsay broke ground on the CIFW, the Correctional Institute for Women, which later became GMDC. Uh, when Ms. Dorkin died, one of the legacies in all of her obituaries was that her testimony helped to tear down the House of D. I can only hope that Ms. Dworkin <clears throat> lays in peace without hearing the testimony of women like Kandra and of women like me who have experienced firsthand the horrors of Rikers Island. I um, have a lot of other comments that I've submitted via email. I hope you don't mind. I don't have a printer at home. But I, I want to emphasize that what I heard from the DOC this morning were blatant lies. I have forwarded you directives that were published in April of 2018 that specifically signed by Commissioner Braun and by Hazel Jennings, her deputy commissioner, that specifically insist that all inmate on inmate uh, complaints of assault, harassment, or abuse uh, are investigated by the first line captains. Right up on the, at the top of that directive, and I emailed it, I believe, uh, at least to all your, your chiefs of staff this morning, at the top of that directive, specifically, there's no mention of a 61 form being filled out. The only mention of any investigatory um, uh, methodology being exerted on inmate, on inmate uh, complaints is a 6500A form. There's no referral to the NYPD. There's no referral to the DA's office. There might be an oath hearing. But if you want to know how the department is ferreting out PREA versus non-PREA complaints, inmate on inmate complaints are now being marked as non-PREA. They are not being referred to the ID. They are not being referred to that NYC DOI. These complaints have literally just fallen into a basket marked non-PREA. And you ask, I heard Ms. Townsend testify this morning that, oh, we have fewer complaints now. <laughs> well, we have fewer complaints because they literally just eviscerated uh, uh, 900 of them that fall into the inmate, inmate on inmate. Um, so those, those particular complaints aren't even being referred to DOI. They're not. They're being investigated and, uh, by the captains, and if criminal um, uh, intent is found, they're being referred to the, to the internal oath trial uh, the disciplinary trials. They're, they're not being referred to the district attorney's office. This is something that I really want you to, to, to look closely at the documentation that I'm sending you. The PREA rule itself on page, I believe it's eight of the PREA rule, very specifically says that all complaints of inmate on inmate um, harassment, rape, sexual assault will be investigated by NYC DOI or DOC DOI, and this is strictly not happening. I, um, I, I'm tired of the sound of my voice and I've exceeded my time, but I hope that you read my testimony. I specifically give details about problems that we've been having with the DOC as we do this work, um, about the closing memo. Um, we've ex ex spent countless hours trying to get FOIL information back from the department. We wanted to know simple things. Are you screening in the, the, sc the new fabulous technical, technological screening tool? Are you including questions about people's status as survivors of trafficking or pimping? And those questions are not being asked. So um, please pay careful attention to my testimony. We did not hear really with certainty anything close to a modicum of truth this morning. And uh, I'm sorry to say that I'm a fly in the ointment pointing this out again and again and again, but please use these tools to go after the DOC. As you said, Councilwoman Rosenthal, it's a shell game with numbers. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and, and to, to all of you, um, thank you for sharing your experiences and your insights. And I, I should note that Everything we hear today helps inform us to be able to make, and certainly some recommendations that were made to make, you know, some 
some to gather insight, but also obviously to look at ways that we can improve any process that we feel is broken um, or or is missing something that can help it accomplish its goal. Um, I wanted to uh, to Miss Reyes, and I, I apologize that you lost some of your time here, but it, it feels like some of the point part that you lost was important in terms of policies and procedures and some and so maybe maybe some recommendations in there. So I wanted to just follow up with a question and um, you, your, your testimony makes note, um, particularly with the trans community, about the you retaliate, retaliation. Can you talk more about, can you be more specific in terms of um, retaliation? Your testimony, you know, uh, affer, you know, talks about solitary confinement as a punishment for those who make allegations. Um, um, female identified officers be searching male identified people. So can you talk more about some of those recommendations that you and uh, that you were making? Absolutely. Um, so in regards to retaliation, I think what's important is kind of like what you were saying in the sense that as a way of punishment, uh, really what I'm getting at within this testimony is that there's a gaslighting, which is a manipulation of psychological means to make people think that the reality isn't true. And what it is is that uh, people are still uh, pretty much being forced into movement, into solitary, and it's being lamed as protection, right, as a way of, you know, monitoring or trying to get them away from whoever is causing them harm, um, specifically sexual violence. Uh, so with that being said, that's kind of what I mean by the retaliation uh, and how it's masked as protection. Uh, and then with the, what's that called? Yeah, so something, and this is coming from my own comment as having gone through a pre training last week, is that I learned that female identified officers are allowed to search male identified people and it's not the other way around, which completely is stereotyp stereotypical and disregarding um, that male identified people can be victims of sexual violence. Um, it perpetuates that myth and that also they can't, it, it perpetuates further shame and not wanting to report. Um, so that could also be huge on where numbers are in the sense of like who's reporting and why it might be decreasing or whatever they're saying this morning or however they're trying to portray that. Um, yeah, so that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely, okay. thank you. <laughs> and and um, to Ms. Clark, uh, we also, I don't know if we have a copy of her testimony, but you do, okay, so we'll, we'll get a copy of it with your recommendations in there as well. Um, the, and I just wanted to, to clarify the comment that the last uh, testimony, which was to say, I think the quote almost directly was, Inmate on inmate violence is not considered as part of PREA. Is that correct? Is it so clear? But that's the that's the the PREA rule does absolutely mandate that all inmate you're, you're on inmate violence. But there's a directive that was issued uh, April 14th, 2018, that specifically mandates that those complaints are not passed along to ID for investigation, and they're not even investigated by PREA. There's a DOC. That's sorry. That was the that was the the door opening from the hearing. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Right outside. I just want to clarify. So the the the, the DOC directive says that inmate on inmate should not be sent to DOI, or they should be sent. Should not. Should not be sent. And to it, which is a, a, against the grain of, of of our own pre rule that says that specifically all inmate on inmate complaints will be investigated by an outside investigator by the I, outside of the unit. Uh, but here in the directive that was issued, and I believe that I can't, you know, open up the brains of the DOC top brass, boy, would I love to. I, I imagine that the reason that, that that directive was issued is so that they could cut down the backlog. And, and uh, or, or I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, without, I mean, we can, we'll follow up with the department, and I, I know they're, they're still, they're still here and represented, um, uh, but it sounds like they put in another, is it, is it, is it fair to say they put in place another mechanism for investigating? It's not DOI, so we'll just, we'll look, look at the, you know, adequacy of investigation, but there's a third party? Is that, is no, that? it's actually the captain of the unit that investigates, so you're asking the people that are tasked with keeping complaint numbers down. <laughs> To, to investigate, um, and these captains haven't even been trained in PREA. You know, they haven't. Um, anyway, I, I quoted and footnoted, footnoted okay, it we'll all. It's, it's all available for you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. I'll hand it to Councilman Rosenthal. Um, so it's difficult. 
Thank you for your bravery, Kendra, Ms. Clark, for um, speaking about what you've encountered. Thanks. That kind of information in, you know, emboldens us to really go to the mat for you and for other people who will undoubtedly be in your, who are in your situation today. Um, and I really similarly want to thank the advocates who work on this tirelessly. Ms. Price, you and I met a while back and I want to thank you for that and thank you for your patience in my reaching back to you. Um, I admire your patience very much. You know, my conclusion from today's hearing and frankly from the hearing that we had on the NYPD SVU, uh, the Special Victims Division, is that, I, this may sound unfair, but is that rape is, these institutions see rape as an annoyance and they don't feel that it's part of their mission to address these issues. And um, uh, we, we, you know, we gotta interrupt that. And we're interrupting it today by having this hearing. Councilman Powers, thank you so much for taking the lead on this. Um, but, you know, I have to ask questions, but you should know I'm a little bit in a state of heartbreaking shock, um, just hearing what you've all dealt with. So, thank you. Um, I guess I wanna start with the PREA training and whether or not you think there's any element in that of trauma, um, you know, trauma-informed, um, survivor-centric uh, training abilities on their part in order to, yeah, please. Thank you, if you don't mind, I've been, I've been on the department I, to introduce Betty. Um, I've been handing them documentation from national victim centers um, for years. We've had meetings, Bobby and, and um, Martha King have organized meetings. When I worked at National Organization for Women, we had meetings there where we talked about all these things. Um, but if, if you hear from the department's own testimony this morning, they mentioned that they try and have all their investigations done within 72 hours of the complaint. Now we know, you know, Condor knows, any victims at sexual violence victims advocate knows that you don't even begin a hardcore investigation until after 72 hours have expired because of the chemical imbalance in the survivor, if, if they have reported right at the moment or closely yeah. thereafter, their own ability to retain memories doesn't even, isn't even restored until at least after 72 or even further four days hour after. So right there, you have proof from the department's own testimony that they're, they're not following. We've been begging and pleading. We've been on our knees. Um, we had all the now interns uh, at the Board of Correction meeting back in July of, of 2016, going over all the different kind of vi victim-centric investigative techniques um, that are out there, um, and we, sure. it, I, I beg your pardon, you can tell where I'm going. The short answer is no, right. no, no, <laughs> not a thing, not a stitch, not a hair. Right, and obviously it exists, that training is out there, and they could be doing it. I think that's an important distinction, so I really appreciate your knowledge base on that, I think we have to move forward on that idea in particular. Um, could you similarly, could you talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned the diversion and the alternatives to incarceration programs that have to be in consideration. Can you expand on that with specific models or recommendations that you all know about? Maybe I'll just say something quickly because I know this is more Kandra's ballywick than mine. I, for one, and because I was an innocent person put on Rikers Island and I got all my charges dismissed and sealed, it's 
a long story. I won't bore you. You, you know the, the basics of it. But I'm not about ATI programs. A lot of the ATI okay. programs, you have to, to plead guilty. You have to take a deal to. And I have a, a big problem with that. I, I do acknowledge that there are a lot of people that they're very helpful for, but I see it being a very slippery slope. While there are programs that are really great and they do exist, I don't believe that ATI, especially for women, girls, trans, intersex, and not gender nonconforming persons, I don't believe that ATIs are the solution. I really believe that we should stop putting people in cages. There are all kinds of people there on Rikers from Michigan. The crimes that we're accused of are completely different than the crimes that men are in there for. I could go on forever, I promise to be short, but I, I, I have foiled that information and people should not even be on Rikers. We, like the, I don't believe that these programs really are useful for more than a fifth of the population. I'll shut up. No, 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 I, oh. you, you, you made a distinction that is important, that people have to accept a plea deal or admit guilt before that happens. That's not my understanding, that there can be, well, I guess that is true. I don't know. I'd like to know more if this ATI, is true. ATI, I mean, is there an ATI pre-trial, I guess, is that the That would question. be an ATD. Yeah, that would be like an alternative to detention, detention. which would be pre-trial, where ATI, you usually right, right. have to plead guilty. So I think, and, and the reason I put ATD, ATD and ATI programs in, first and foremost, if we ended cash bail, 70% of the people on Rikers wouldn't be there. Yeah. So that would eliminate a lot of the issues right there. Um, and we know all the problems around cash bail. Um, and, you know, by telling my story, if I would have gotten those, those um, supportive services before um, you know the trauma got to the point where it was or before I engaged in drugs and alcohol at 10 maybe then I wouldn't have ever ended up in jail to begin with so obviously we want supportive programs first even before ATD and ATI I want you to be able to get mental health I, I'm still in therapy today and it's only through now understanding trauma that I can even talk about this to people so how could we ever think that correction officers could you know keep us safe if they have no understanding of trauma and it's taken me years to understand my own trauma. Um, so I think going with the supportive programs first, understanding the intersectionality between uh, the domestic violence, mental health, substance use, um, and what gets you into the criminal justice system to begin with, and preventing that and giving them the supportive services. But then if we do get to that point, um, and I think of maybe my last conviction, I was facing four felonies and I'm a misdemeanor. I, I did do something wrong, right? It was a, a big case. It wasn't something that was small. So in my case, um, we still need to come up with some idea of, we still have to have, there still has to be a line, right? The, the world still needs to be safe. People can't be committing crimes. So we still need to come up with some kind of, of uh, you know, negotiation. And I think that's where ATD and ATI programs could fall into place, depending on, you know, the, the history of the person, the history of the crime, the extenuating circumstances that went into it. And when we talk about women specifically, you'll see in my testimony, and you guys hit on it a lot, you know, 90% of women that are inside were sexually abused or physically abused as children. Almost 90% have been abused as an, an, you know, into adulthood. So these are very specialized um, issues that we face as women and that should be informed and infused in everything that moving forward with DOC, the design, the staffing, the you know, all of the, the new things that are going to go into this facility. Can I ask you, is that part of the intake form? Intake that form for? question asked <laughs> as part of the intake on, form? On Rikers? Yeah. We would love, when they give you that intake form, say, please, please know. pass it along <laughs> because they denied FOILs. <laughs> I never completed an intake form. I think the only, and when we did, um, what was it called? When you're in, in the pens before you're getting sentenced, uh, it's like a probation report or something like that. Yeah, and they do like a report where some of that information is kept. I remember talking to them about it, but I never, Rikers never asked me any of these questions. Um, when I went there. I know that was in 2010, I know it's a little bit different now, but I also work at, working at the Fortune Society, you know, I have women in my program who are in ATI programs, and I ask them every day, you know, did you still have a male officer guard you? Because last time I talked to DOC, they said, oh, it's not a problem anymore because um, only female officers are over the, the female, off like the female inmates now, the incarcerated people now. Um, and so they said that wasn't happening. But when I talked to my girls who just came off of Rikers a week ago, they're saying it's still happening. So I'm way more inclined to believe them who I'm getting real firsthand accounts from on a daily basis. And according to them, the harassment assault hasn't changed. I didn't even know some of the things that DOC was saying about these 
uh, PREA managers and compliance people. I. I've never heard of these people. I still have girls that come into our program that don't know what PREA means. So if they don't know what the word means, then how could DOC possibly be telling them about it? How could there be a pamphlet? How could there be anything um, if they still don't even know what it means? Well, do they say whether or not they got the pamphlet? I mean, they could. Uh, this is the first time I ever heard about a pamphlet. So this will be my next question of asking them if they receive a pamphlet. But I was always just asking them if they knew even what Priya stood for, because I, I knew about it. But I've never even heard of a pamphlet until today. So that'll be my next question for them. Right, right. Um, and let us know, and also whether or not it's multilingual. Uh, right. Right. Um, so, but I want to continue, we don't have to do it now, but I'd like to continue this thread of thinking about um, alternatives to detention, getting the non-violent, um, you know, the women who are at Rikers for non-violent crime, crimes out, you know, so they wouldn't even have to get into Rikers. Um, and part of that conversation, I think housing is gonna be around part of that conversation too. When we talk about ATD and ATI, women need safe, supportive housing, that they, permanent housing that they're gonna be able to go into, because um, that's also a problem. Sometimes we go back to housing. I know for myself, I was released from prison into a marriage that I didn't wanna be in, into pretty much an unsafe house, but because I was on parole, there's really not too much that you can do. Um, so you know, housing is a big concern because we do, I think as women, put ourselves in more unsafe positions if we need a, you know, we still need somewhere to stay. We still have housing issues. and. Uh, housing for our children also is, is going to be an important thing. And sorry, if I may add a comment. I also want to open up in the idea of like, yes, let's get definitely nonviolent folk out and also, especially considering my program, people sometimes survivorship looks like violence, right? We work with folks at SEPS and AVP with people who have had to resort to violence for survivorship, especially if we're talking about intimate partner violence, mm -hmm. right? And through the 30 years that Steps has been working at Riker, specifically Rosie's, they have countless testimonies and stories that unfortunately I can't name because we were trying to figure out confidentiality, but anyways, um, they have plenty of experience to talk about what it means when you're labeled as a violent offender instead of a survivor. So. And, and to go along with that also, uh, you know, one of the stats that I have in here that we talk about, there are a lot of women that are inside for killing the partner that was abusing them. Sure, so sure. that's a violent crime, but, you know, these are women that we would obviously sure. want out. And going back with the violent crime, too, hurt people hurt people. So I just don't want you to think that yep. because you were violent at one point means mm -hmm. that you're going to be violent your whole life or that, you know, that was some natural thing about you. I think it's just hurt people hurt people, and, and we can give the supportive services to rectify those situations and really transform our future. That's really what I want to see is a transformation for not just women and girls and, the, and you know, the LGBTQI community, but for all of us, a transformative carceral system, really reimagining what it looks like, who we incarcerate, what we incarcerate for, what programs, what the space looks like, the, the whole gamut of it. Not only do hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. Heal people, exactly. Thank you for getting that on the record. Um, I appreciate that. Do you have specific, I'm not necessarily asking you to name these right now, but do you have specific res recommendations for the facilities that will be built um, so that uh, there's no place that where uh, an officer could uh, rape someone in a, hidden, in a closet where there's no camera focused on that closet. Uh, can and has somebody asked for those recommendations? Do you have a place to channel those recommendations? So at the beginning of the summer, I think in May, um, Mock J asked for recommendations from the community about the design of jails. Okay. And Kathy Morris and I and a couple other girls from Close Rosie's put together our recommendations and got ourselves invited to the, the design meetings that were run by Osborne. She's still here. Um, where we uh, interfaced directly with the architects and the designers. And there were great sandwiches there, but we got about 30 seconds to speak. And I brought our brief, and specifically our really big ask was, we want the investiga investigative, I beg your pardon, investigative, investigative spaces um, camouflaged with program spaces. Because now, if you're going to make a report, 
the staff knows you're going to make a report. And you heard this morning, they even said that they, they know about complaints because they get an email about a phone call. Well, that's because they're screening, they're telephone screening, and that's one thing we don't like. The, the, the telephone screening, picking up complaints is, is a whole other issue. But specifically, we were asking for architectural camouflage so that um, it wasn't obvious that you were making a, a report of rape or sexual assault or even violence um, when you did it so that you weren't retaliated against. Um, and, and often a lot of people will make a, a minor complaint. They'll make a complaint about harassment or they'll make a complaint about another inmate just so they don't get retaliated against. Um, but we specifically said this is our big ask as women and girls that have been invited, invited to these meetings. This is what we want. We want camouflage. And we were summarily poo-pooed. Like, like literally we were gaslighted by the designers. They said to us, oh, well, camouflage is the last thing you want in a jail, right? Because that's a pro... And, and they literally wrote us off. So if you could somehow push that particular idea, I think it's one of the only ones that we have room to say anything about at this point, because they're really... They're, well, at least they're giving us the illusion that they're listening to us. But if, if you could back that up a little bit, that would be wonderful. And I was a little disappointed the environmental scan that came out a few weeks ago that we read. The word woman wasn't mentioned once in it. I know that they still have a lot to do with the designs of the new buildings, but I didn't see any areas for nurseries. I didn't see visiting rooms that, I just, I, I really want to make sure that people with lived experience, specifically women and, and you know, people who are impacted by the justice system are really involved in those meetings and make sure that um, we can really have a true community center within that, within that jail. I was going to ask you that. I mean, given, and this will be the last one, I know we have to wrap up, but, you know, given that uh, right now on Rikers, women are physically separated, what is going to happen or what's your recommendation for when there's a jail in every borough? Um, will, would your recommendation be that each of those jails have a separate section for women or would your recommendation be that there still be a single jail for women? I mean, my recommendation, if, if, I mean, this is my personal recommendation, if we're talking about building communities and getting people closer to their communities, yeah. then why would men have the, again, uh, you know, um, opportunity to have be in their own communities, but then women get all centralized into one? That's still going to create visiting issues for people. Um, it's, I, I still, I just don't think it's as community centric. I really was hoping that the women would get their own space in each borough. Um, with their own nurseries in each borough, with their own visiting rooms in each borough. Uh, and if we, you know, push all the bail reform and all these ATI and all these other things, the, the population could get down so low that I don't think it should be as big of a problem. And I, I absolutely agree with Kanda, but I don't believe that building a jail at 80 Center Street is the solution. If you look at the the zip codes that feed Rosie's from Manhattan, all 25 of the top zip codes are uptown. So I, I, I really don't understand why we're building the jail down here at 80 Center Street. Is Cy Vance getting an office too? I'm, I, I don't understand, but that, that's a different hearing. Okay. Thank you all so much for your patience today and in life. I, and I want to just add, <laughs> I agree. And I, uh, I wanted to know two things. One is, I, as I understand it from the recent plans, there is a woman's facility in all four borough jails rather than one centralized one. I will, we will. But a centralized nursery, I think they said. Uh, and a nursery, I believe, in Queens. Uh, but, but I think there's a facility in each one, and then I think with the hospital, and maybe Queens Hospital, but it's a good point, we'll clarify it. Um, and I think that was a question that, um, and maybe there be, you may be right, there may be not be four nurseries, but I think it was a question that we had when we got the briefing on it, is how are you gonna handle um, populations that have been traditionally been held in one, in one place and jails, thank you. Um, one quick question, and then we will move on, um, but an important question, I think is just the, the process for coming forward. And the question is, um, did you see hesitancy from women to come forward? And is there, was, are there any ideas or thoughts or recommendations on how to improve? I, certainly there's some more reporting mechanisms and things, but is there other suggestions in terms of how to encourage people to come forward if they believe there's a need for it? Do you want to start? Um, 
as we've been briefly joined by our speaker, Corey Johnson, as well. So I'll definitely let these two take away most of it in the sense of lived experience, but something that comes to from like me bearing witness to this is, I mean, definitely there's struggles. I mean, you hear it from inside those facilities, your community as fellow people who are incarcerated. When you hear from other people, their experience in reporting and feeling like they're the ones being investigated and not receiving a trauma-informed or survivor-centered response, mm -hmm. that is going to obviously discourage someone from reporting. Something I was curious about and I put as a recommendation is, is there space for feedback to evaluate these experiences, right? So the same way you have a training and then there's a feedback for the people who do this, is there feedback from the people who are reporting about their experience with PREA officers and DO or whoever it is, you know, that like the staff that's supposed to serve them, I should say, you know? I would just say the number one thing that you can do to encourage reporting is hire dedicated investigators. The DOC today said they have 24 investigators, but they're not all PREA dedicated. They have other responsibilities too. Last year, we had 12. Now we have 24. We were pro anyway, they've had the money. The number one thing you can do is get rid of the backlog and, and come forward with investigations that reinforce that the survivor will be delivered some modicum of justice and not that the institution will be defended and covered up. That's the number one thing you can do. Number one thing. And they've had a blank check to hire these investigators. And they've denied all kinds of very qualified people interviews. I know a number of SART and savvy um, nurses that have applied to be investigators and haven't even gotten an interview. So for the DOC to say that their, their, their pool is very low, this is absolutely untrue. There are retired NYPD police officers that have applied <laughs> and they haven't even gotten interviews. So the number one thing you can do, more investigate, dedicated investigators. And I think from my personal experience, um, because of the trauma I experienced throughout my entire childhood, there was no way in hell I was going to report something to, to Rikers on an officer that did. I mean, I was scared to death, and I think um, that having it, I didn't even trust DOC. You know, like, I, th those weren't, how could you report something to somebody you don't even trust? So I think when we, when she, you know, we're talking about the investigators that they're going to hire, we have to come up with a better solution, too, to make the women who are incarcerated actually trust them and engage them. Because if they still just see them as DOC, even if it's an investigator, they're still going to worry about the backlash or worry that, you know, the trauma is going to be even worse um, because of their lived experience and what they've already experienced doing that. We need an entirely different agency. Yes. This is something I propose to the Charter Commission is coming up with a new agency just to investigate rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment um, by the NYPD, by the DOC, by the Department of Education, any city agency. I, I think it would be a really, we're, the CCRB is trying to, everyone's trying to do the same thing. Why don't we just have one ubiquitous agency? Why can't we create that? I feel like it should be a priority. We have five of the 12 charter review commissioners that are women. Why can't we get them on board with this? Of the mayoral charter revision. Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your testimony recommendations. And we would uh, look, look forward to continue to work with folks here on, on questions, especially around how to ensure that people feel safe in reporting and coming forward and have an adequate process to address their, their complaints and reports. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We have a next panel. We have Julia Davis from Children's Defense Fund, Deborah Lolai from uh, Bronx Defenders, uh, Kelsey Diavilla from Republican Defenders, and Barbara Hamilton from Legal Aid. This is our last panel. Thank you, and again, um, we'll start this way, going this way, and uh, we'll ask you again to just you know, say your name, your affiliation, and then we'll give you two minutes to testify and uh, follow up questions. And I, I should recognize that we, uh, you guys have all, I'm sure, been here for a very long time, and we appreciate you uh, sitting through a long hearing. And so, and apologies for our exhaustive questioning. And <clears throat> similar to what I said to the previous panel, these really help inform our ability to make 
uh, de you know, decisions and to take action in, in places where we feel are deficiencies. So we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thanks much. You can stop. Great. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Julia Davis. I'm the Director of Youth Justice and Child Welfare for the Children's Defense Fund in New York, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. We are alarmed, obviously, like many others, about the reports of sexual abuse and harassment, and we want to emphasize today the focus on young people, which hasn't come through um, in today's discussions, but young people in our jails are especially vulnerable. Um, and I mean to include LGBT youth as well as young people in general. And those young people really face a much higher risk of sexual abuse and sexual assault and harassment. We've talked a lot today about the enormous backlog and I want to highlight a couple of things. Incomplete investigations put individual victims at risk, but they also put the entire community at risk until we get to the bottom of what's happened, which means closing the report and bringing that process to completion. We don't know that things are okay. Despite the representations today that an investigation may proceed within 72 hours, the conclusion of an investigation and the approval of the investigation is essential for safety. I want to emphasize also um, some reporting that came out of the Nunez uh, Monitor's report that we haven't heard about. And that's specifically related to investigations of 18, 19, and 20 year olds. In that report, the Nunez Monitor reported that, that there's evidence of significant structural problems such as the failure to interview key witnesses, long delays to witness interviews, and apparent failure to ask effective follow-up questions or to collect relevant evidence. These types of processes go way beyond the timeline concerns that you heard about today. These are really about the nuts and bolts of doing thorough investigations to determine what actually happened and the risk that facing everyone in our jails, but especially young people and, and LGBT kids in, in particular. This is a critical moment for you and for the board, and so we encourage you to continue to collaborate as you are watching their process of remediation going forward. Thank you. Should I wait for the clock? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Barbara Hamilton. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Society. I work for the Special Litigation Unit. Um, and I just want to thank the council for their interest in this topic. My role is that for the last, since 2010, I have worked at Rikers Island and I represent almost every detainee held there in challenges against the New York City Department of Correction for solitary confinement. Um, and other security related issues. As a result of that, I've had extensive contact with the inmate population and part of that contact is uh, becoming counsel on two sex abuse cases and also representing women during DOI investigations and such issues. And I know in two minutes I cannot compress nine years of experience, so I would just like to say that Legal Aid has submitted um, written suggestions and to illustrate that I would like to just share some general experiences of clients. Um, the recent case that was referenced uh, earlier this morning by Councilmember Rosenthal, the Jane Doe, I did hand out a few copies of the complaints that was filed last week. That client was not supervised and she was brutally raped and she had no um, faith in the investigative system there and so she saved DNA evidence and mailed it out herself because she had made a prior complaint. Um, if I can encompass what the women that I have spoken to, and I've spoken to scores of them, and women like Ms. Clark, I don't know if she's still here, I commend them because they're the ones that come forward. But for the ones that come forward, there are a hundred that don't. And I hold all of their stories with me, and so I'm just trying to think of the best way to express what they would want me to say. And I think the number one thing is they want to know why they're not equal. Why are they not, why are they so held accountable for things that they've done wrong, but the correctional staff is not? And that's the big issue here is accountability. There's very few prosecutions, and there's very few um, administrative terminations where people are terminated, DOC staff are sexually abusing women at Rose M. Singer. In addition, the mechanisms for reporting, my understanding, are still, they are not confidential. I just spoke to women last week. Their PIN numbers are being used to make these 311 calls. Um, and also, they don't feel like when they speak to a PREA coordinator at the facility, if they have to make a complaint, that that's confidential. So for these reasons, Legal Aid is rep recommending an investigative entity that's independent of the Department of Correction. We would like to implement body cameras that are worn, so when correction officers are in those areas outside of uh, video surveillance, that there's, there's no question about what's going on. Um, 
and that the resources be given to the board or an independent agency to fully implement PRE at the city jails. Hello, uh, my name is Kelsey Diabula. I'm the jail services social worker at Brooklyn Defender Services. I just want to say thank you to all of you for your questions today to the department. Um, I do appreciate it. Uh, just within my time, I um, I just want to focus on the investigation piece because I know it's been a, a huge uh, discussion point today. Um, you know, today we learned that, which were new, new numbers for I think all of us, that uh, the current backlog is 1,081. Um, you know, and, and just to quote Dr. Cohen, you know that it is really embarrassing. It's unacceptable, and we know that when DOC fa uh, fails to conclude these cases, uh, what's happening is that DOC staff are still employed. Uh, you know, memories fade. Uh, evidence is lost, and you know witnesses move. And so, to conclude those cases, um, the question mark is really difficult. Um, and I just want to like share a story uh, very quickly about a client, a, a recent um, case that happened. Uh, we'll call him Mr. W. Uh, Mr. W was raped by another incarcerated man on his housing unit. Mr. W took proactive steps and reported the rape to 311 and his housing officer. Despite his own self-advocacy, neither he nor the other man were moved. Our client continued to report the sexual assault to DOC officers and even a DOC captain. Yet still, he, uh, he was not moved. Mr. W was raped again in the same house unit by the same man a week later. Investigators finally interviewed Mr. W, but despite their interaction, Mr. W was not separated from the man. Mr. W was raped again. More than two weeks later, our client spit on a DOC officer, and only then was he moved to another, more restrictive housing unit. He knew that by committing this act on DOC staff, he would finally be moved. It was an act of desperation after being repeatedly failed by those in power. I, we agree with, uh, with Barbara Hamilton and Legal Aid Society that um, you know, all uh, sex abuse is criminal behavior that should always be referred to and investigated by an uh, independent agency, whether that's Department of Investigation. Uh, and um, you know, in our experience, uh, for myself in our uh, jail services division, we will report all cases of sexual abuse to the uh, Board of Correction, Department of Investigation, and Department of Correction. And in our experience, uh, most of those cases, uh, though referred to Department of Investigation, are kicked back to Department of Correction to investigate their own staff. Uh, we find this unacceptable, and we uh, believe it's a conflict of interest, and we would appreciate the uh, council support in encouraging Department of Investigation or an outside agency to take all sexual abuse cases, especially those involving DOC staff. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Powers, Chair Rosenthal. Um, I know Chair Lansman's not here, but I thank him too as well. Yes. <laughs> um, and to all the committee members, my name is Deborah Lalloy, and I am a criminal defense attorney at the Bronx Defenders. I am also the LGBTQ client specialist at the Bronx Defenders. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on this very important matter. The Bronx Defenders is a community-based and nationally recognized holistic public defender office dedicated to serving the people of the Bronx. We provide innovative, holistic, client-centered criminal defense, family defense, immigration representation, civil legal services, social work support, and other advocacy to indigent people of the Bronx. Our staff of over 300 represents approximately 20, 28,000 individuals each year in the Bronx and beyond. The Bronx Defenders promotes criminal justice reform to dismantle the culture of mass incarceration. I'm here today to speak about the, the experiences of sexual abuse and harassment against transgender women, specifically in jail. As part of my role as the LGBTQ client specialist, each year I represent hundreds of transgender people who are facing criminal charges, many of whom are or have been incarcerated pretrial. I will start by sharing the simple fact. Nearly 100% of our clients who are transgender women are sexually abused or harassed while incarcerated in our city jails. The numbers are so much higher than what's being reported, and that's because of a fear of retaliation. Not everybody is reporting, but they are telling their lawyers, so we have the actual numbers. 
And this is because they are placed in men's jails. The process of, of a transgender woman being arrested and incarcerated in New York City is as follows. When a transgender woman is arrested, she is placed in a men's holding cell or in a cell by herself by the NYPD. She is then brought to central bookings and is placed in a cell with men or in a cell by herself again while she awaits her arraignment. Throughout this process, she is the subject of jokes and ridicule about her gender identity by officers. If bail is set or if she is remanded, she will go through intake through the Department of Corrections, which we've heard a lot about today, and this determines where she will be placed. From the initial contact with NYPD through the end of her incarceration, the experiences of transgender women are horrific. In New York City, as you've heard today, there is a transgender housing unit, also known as the THU, and the THU is a unit that transgender women could apply to and be placed in during their incarceration. It was created as a result of the disproportionate rate of sexual abuse against incarcerated transgender women. There is a limited number of beds at the THU. Applications are regularly rejected, and it can be days, even months, before an application is processed and a transgender woman is placed there. At best, the THU has been managed inadequately. And I urge you to read the assessment that the Board of Corrections um, published. It's, it's truly a good reflection of, of how terribly the THU is being managed. They should always be informed about the option of being placed at the THU, but as the assessment report shows, they are regularly not informed of this option. In fact, what I hear regularly from my clients is that DOC intake staff discourages our clients from applying to the THU. As a result, transgender women are sent to men's jails, either in protective custody or in general population. And this is why sexual abuse and harassment occurs at such an alarming rate against them. The experience of our clients range from being called insulting transphobic names to being forced to pull down their bras by male correction officers and having their breasts fondled to being raped. This happens every single day to, our tra to transgender women in our city jails. And I will briefly share a couple of stories that I think are important to be told. The first client I'm going to tell you about is a young transgender woman who was incarcerated at a men at a men's jail as she was awaiting trial. Prior to her arrest, she was homeless because her family rejected her after she came out as transgender. During her incarceration at Rikers Island, she was raped by an inmate and severely traumatized. After this, she lived every moment of her incarceration with extreme fear. She did not have a criminal record before this arrest. And she was not guilty of the crime she was charged with. Yet, she pled guilty to a felony because pleading guilty meant that she would get out of jail. This is a common experience and occurrence. Another client of mine who was also incarcerated in a men's unit at Rikers Island was placed in general population where she was raped in the shower by another inmate. After reporting the rape, she was placed in protective custody, yet it was still in the same facility where the first attack occurred. Three days after she was placed in protective custody, another inmate was able to get into her cell during count and raped her again. These are stories that need to be told. They need to be told because we are failing to keep incarcerated transgender women safe. The bills before your committees today requiring period public reporting of incidents of sexual abuse among residents of and visitors to the city jails are a small but very important step towards increased transparency in the crucial area overdue, long overdue for reform. And we strongly support them all. In addition, we heard about the announcement that by October 13th, all inmates should be housed in accordance with their gender identity, the announcement made by the mayor and the commission. We are unaware of any significant planning by DOC to make this real and have grave doubt that it will occur. 
We urge the council to monitor the situation closely and to schedule an oversight hearing before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to, to all uh, four of you for your testimony and recommendations, which we will, uh, as we do our sort of uh, post hearing, go through all the recommendations and look for um, ideas that we feel are, are good ones for the council and obviously recommendations to make to the administration and others. So thank you for all that. I wanted to just follow up on the THU for a second. Um, in, in, and this is fine to everybody, but certainly based on the testimony we just heard. Um, do you find that the clients that are in the THU are experiencing a higher occurrence of abuse than those who are in the general population? No. No. Uh, Consistent? N no, I think, um, I think that the reason peop women want to go into the THU is because they're scared of being in general population. And, and the reason they're scared is because they're being placed with men. Um, and so, so no, I think, um, I think it's, it's safer in the THU. And I can comment on that as well. Um, I worked at DOC prior to working at Legal Aid as a staff member, and you would see uh, trans women coming in to the male facilities, and you would be terrified for them because there was no place to put them. Now the reports are coming back that individuals are much safer in the THU. Um, one caveat here is that I think that's something needs to be worked on for those who are in methadone maintenance. Uh, those trans women are kept in male facilities while they're in maintenance, and they're not being transferred to the THU as of now. So that's something that the council should be aware of, is that just because you're on a maintenance program doesn't mean that you should be housed and at risk of harm and sexual assault. And, and let me be clear, the concept of the THU is a great one. Right, right. Um, if it were being run effectively, um, the problem is that people are being rejected for reasons that are not being disclosed to us. Um, people are being kicked out of the THU for various reasons and sent right back into general population in men's facilities. Um, and, and it can take, like I said, days to months for, for an application to be processed through this completely non-transparent process that DOC has. I have no idea what the criteria are for, for someone to get accepted. And every single minute that a transgender woman is in a men's prison is placing her at risk for sexual assault. So e even if it's just for one day, it's, it's, a, t it's a terrifying thing. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to that, um, you know, we, we had a similar story where uh, a client, a transgender woman, had requested THU. Uh, she did this on her own before our, our office got involved and did any advocacy uh, on her behalf. Uh, she requested it, and then it took a, over a month for DOC to even give her like make a decision. Uh, little did we know that they made that decision and didn't even tell her. Uh, so she was just waiting uh, while sitting in a men's facility. Um, during that time, she was being sexually harassed and assaulted, uh, abused, and uh, you know, we had worked, we worked with a Lardy from DOC, uh, their pre-coordinator, to get her moved, and it was, I think, uh, to help with the Board of Correction to actually get a response, a written response of her denial for THU, um, and then, then we got into questions about how do we appeal, how do we go about it, um, and unfortunately, she ended up taking a plea deal just to get out of the situation, um, and, and so it was a really horrific, um, Case. Just a follow-up question. Is there a timeline by which an individual has to receive their determination? This might be a DOC question, but just since we're on top. Yeah, we, we believe it's five days. Five days. Under the yeah. DOC. Under, under, the, yeah, under the DOC directive. Okay. okay, thank you. But we could double check that. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you. I'll let Councilman Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, do you know offhand how many beds there are in the THU? I should have asked this morning. I don't. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, just based on the testimony that was given today, it seems like the, the capacity is about, uh, they've had approximately at the highest about 13 people there. But I do think that there are more beds than, than 13. Um, I also don't know how it's set up now at Rosie's. It might, it might be different because it was very recently transferred to Rosie's. Um, perhaps the Board of Corrections or Department of Corrections could answer that better. Do you know if when they're at, again, these are questions I should have asked DOC, so do you just happen to know if when they're at the THU they get the same service services uh, they would have gotten otherwise? 
um, um, you know, methadone treatment or programs? Um, no, they definitely don't get the same services that other um, inmates have access to. There are some specialized services that, that um, people in the THU have. For example, someone who works at an LGBTQ-specific organization that provides legal or social services may come in once a month or so uh, to talk to the women there. However, it is a problem because there are a lot of um, services that people in general population, for example, that have access to can engage in that are very helpful for their criminal cases that, the, that our clients in the THU don't have access to. Um, you know, one of our, one of my confusion, one of the reasons that I think we've been asking about whether or not it's safer in the THU is simply from the fact that at Rosie's people are more likely, you know, there's a higher incidence of sexual assault. And I think part of the question is, um, are the corrections officers there who are there? who are perpetrating this offense going to now be perpetrating it as well at the THU? Um. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, one that I have not thought of. Uh, but, but I will say this, across the board, um, the preference is for transgender women to be housed with women, whether it's in the THU or in general population or in protective custody. Um, across the board, amongst our clients and the advocates who are working around this issue is that they should be placed in women's facilities. Do you have any idea of a number of the data? You know, how many uh, trans women are not placed in at Rosie's or at the THU or protective custody, as you said? I mean, it, do, uh, it, you know, or even a sense of the number. Are we talking about 100 people? Are we talking about 10 people? Um, as far as, I, I can only speak to what I know from our clients of the Bronx Defenders. Um, prior to the THU being moved to Rosie's, there were no, for, I've been at the Bronx Defenders for four years and like I said, I represent hundreds of transgender people every year and I have never had a, trans, a client who is a transgender woman be placed at Rosie's and I still, unless they're at, I have no clients in the THU right now, but, and there are no, I have no transgender clients at Rosie's right now. So they're all in the general population. They're all in men's facilities in general population or protective custody in men's and, prisons. And as you say, yeah. it's hundreds of people who you are seeing. Yes, training. not all of my clients are incarcerated. Um, I would say about 20 to 30 at once. Okay. Anyone else want to add or take a? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience today. Um, just one more comment to provide um, you with some clarification about the conversation you were having earlier about ATIs. Yeah. Um, it, it's true. Uh, one does need to take a, a guilty plea in order to have access to an ATI, and it's actually really problematic, especially for our transgender and gender nonconforming clients, because there are no ATIs in New York City that are fully culturally competent and um, have staff working with our clients directly who will work with them in a respectful way. And so what happens then is that our clients end up failing those programs. And when you take a plea deal and you take a deal to complete an ATI, the understanding and the promise is that if you don't complete it successfully, if you leave, there's a jail alternative, right? So for example, there could be a, a one or, or five year jail alternative. Right? And so what we see happen a lot if for our transgender and gender nonconforming clients is that they cannot complete the programs because they're so um, disrespected and harassed and abused at these programs, and, and frankly, in, in very similar ways as they are at, at uh, Rikers Island. Right? And so they leave even when they're not supposed to and end up needing to have to do um, an alternative jail sentence. And I just have one more remark regarding the investigative process. Um, I've sat through all the hearings, and I just don't think it came out very clearly 
uh, how the process actually works, and it's something that I've had to learn extensively through litigation and representing women, and it's that when an individual makes a complaint about sexual assault, um, it can go through many different channels, but assuming it goes through one of the channels, what happens is, is that a complaint is generated to the COD unit, it's, um, it's a centralized operations desk, and it's a trailer that's held at Rikers, and that unit decides where that complaint is farmed out to. Usually, if there's criminal conduct or there's an allegation of criminal conduct, DOI will get first crack at the investigative process. So when DOC was talking about, okay, well, DOI refers these cases back to us, what happens is, is if DOI says, okay, we don't see um, Hang on one evidence, second. Yep. Okay. evidence of criminal activity, we're going to give the case back to the DOC investigative division. What their mandate says is that they are supposed to investigate for breaking internal rules, for DOC rules. And they are supposed to prosecute those cases in their trials and litigation um, case. And if during that point they uncover criminal um, conduct, they're supposed to refer the case back to DOI. So the investigative process can get confusing who the players are. And in fact, we had a client, um, we had a case where the correction officer's case was referred back to ID and they didn't prosecute him within the statute of limitations and he's still on the payroll after, you know, sexually abusing our client. So this is a common issue. And the issue with DOC policing itself, the DOI, I mean, I'm sorry, the ID division employs correction officials. People are in the same union. Um, these are the majority of their investigator pool. Maybe this has changed over the last few months that I'm not aware of, but I am not aware of this change. And so that's another interesting situation is that people, they can get rid of staff without criminal conduct who are engaging in sexual abuse of detainees through the administrative process, but that's being underutilized. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for, for all of you for, for lasting to the end of us. And of course, thank you to both BOC and DOC staff who have stayed here as well. We will, as a committee, continue to discuss this issue in ways that we can address many things we heard today. I, gotta, I wanna give a very big shout out to my co-chair here, uh, Councilman Rosenthal, and to all the staff here for helping us to prepare for this and certainly sitting through with this with us as well. Uh, and thank you to everybody who came to testify and uh, with that being said, we are uh, adjourned. Thank you.